Chevron Nigeria Lagos. Ms. Uzo, please, could you come over to the stage? Thank you. We have our very own respected Leonard Senior Advocate of Nigeria, a man who I have tremendous respect for, Mr. Ola Yode Delano, S. Senior Advocate of Nigeria. He is the partner at Kim Delano Legal Practitioners, Lagos. All the way from Angola, Africa, we have no other but Miss Renata Valenti. Miss Renata Valenti is a partner in PLMJ Collab Angola. RVA Angola. You're welcome. Please make your way up to the stage. Do we have our colleagues joining us virtually on now? Yes, can you hear us now? Thank you. So very quickly, we have Andrew Nellon. Andrew Nellon is a partner in Vincent and El. morning. I mean, can you hear me? Yes, you, you dropped out for a moment there, but we can hear you again. Now. Great, fantastic. Um, the last but certainly not the, the least is Mohamed El Nabi. Mohamed El Nabi is the vice branch manager and technical and commercial manager of the Arab contractors Cairo. Good morning, Mohamed. Good so morning, Andrew, sir. Fantastic. Thank you, Mohammed. Andrew, over to you now. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you all for joining today's session titled A Future of Turnkey Contracting on the African Continent, Opportunities and Challenges. On behalf of myself and each of the panelists, I'd like to thank the ACL for the opportunity to speak at the conference today. Um, I've had a brief introduction. My name is Andrew Nealon. I'm the moderator for this session. I'm a partner at the law firm Vincent Elkins. Um, and reside in the firm's London office. Um, I advise on project development and finance, primarily in the energy and infrastructure sectors and have a particular focus on large scale EPC contracts. Um, I've more than 20 years experience advising on some of the largest and most complex energy and infrastructure projects across the globe. And in Africa, I've advised on projects in Morocco, Namibia, Zambia, South Africa, Madagascar and Mozambique. Um, on today's panel, um, you've already heard that I'm joined by eminent experts in construction. Now. As you'll see, we have speakers with a focus on different regions on the continent and with different sector speciality, which will hopefully give us a good cross industry insight into the opportunities and challenges with respect to EPC contracting in Africa. So with that, I'll give a bit more of an introduction to our first panelist, um, Uzu Ozo. Uzo is a legal advisor in the Nigeria and Mid-African Business Unit of Chevron with more than 15 years of experience in the energy sector. She oversees the delivery of business-focused legal support on complex gas, commercial and supply chain related transactions. Uzo is an expert in EPC contracts, having supported multi-billion dollar and multi-jurisdictional EPC projects in lead contracting roles. In addition, she's the non-executive director of the financial institution, institution the vice chair of our Nigerian Gas Association subgroup and a member of the Women in Energy Network. Um, so I'll now hand over to Uzo, who will give us a short presentation on the future of EPC contracting in Africa from a Nigerian upstream energy sector perspective. Uzo.
Okay. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. And um, good morning and good afternoon to others who have joined online. So <clears throat> this morning, can we go back to, to the um, cover slide? Thank you. So I will be speaking about um, EPC contracting challenges and opportunities with um, a focus on the upstream energy sector. So you will find that the challenges and opportunities of EPC contracting are really similar across industries. And that you will find from the discussions that we have this morning. Um, but I will bring just um, an added touch from an energy sector upstream perspective. And then I will focus a bit in Africa and uh, Nigeria particularly. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you. So the first challenge I will talk about, and I will just focus on three key challenges. There are numerous challenges, but I will touch on three key challenges and opportunities. The first challenge I would talk about is declining investment. So this is a global challenge, but then of course it's a major challenge for um, Africa and particularly Nigeria. And when I talk about declining investment, I'm not talking about energy transition just yet. This really relates to um, declining investments from an internal funding allocation perspective. So where are investors um, allocating their funds to? It's um, known today that several projects are competing for capital. So where are internal, um, where are, are investors allocating the internal funds. That's what this really covers. And, um, you know, what we see from the trends are that investors are focused on short cycle, high return investments. And so what that means really is that there's a greater focus on subsea tiebacks, there's a greater focus on small capital projects, different from what we would see in the past where you would have major capital projects or the really, um, multi-billion dollar type projects. There is now a greater focus on short cycle, high return investment. Now for us in Africa, you know, the, the numbers are really clear. There is a huge decline in um, capital expenditure in Africa, and of course, even more so in Nigeria. And um, some of the reasons, you know, I did mention already that globally, there is now a focus on short cycle projects, high return projects, but for Nigeria particularly, some of the reasons that we see with declining investment are the cost premium with undertaking projects in, in Nigeria. And there are a plethora of reasons why that cost premium is you know, um, unique to African projects and also unique to projects in Nigeria. Um, we also do have the issue around timing of delivery of projects that is a major issue. And so with constrained capital, something has to happen around the cost premium with executing projects in Nigeria and the time for delivery of projects because it really um, is almost opposite of what investors are looking for today around short cycle, high return investments. The implications for APC contracting, of course, would potentially be that we would see significantly fewer sanctioned projects, and then reduced um, EPC contracting activities. Next. So the next challenge I'll talk about um, has to do with high rate of delays and disruptions to EPC projects. So fundamentally, the reason why EPC um, strategy would be adopted by parties would be because you want to deliver projects on time and, and um, within the budget that is allotted. With delays and disruptions, you then really go to the root of why you chose the EPC strategy in the first place, which then becomes um, a challenge or questions the continued adoption of this particular uh, contracting strategy. So, you know, the numbers we see here again, these are global numbers, but the numbers for Africa are even um, more sobering than what we see uh, um, on a global scale. And so the idea is that we really have to get to that point where we have low cost escalations and low schedule delays for the, 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 the basis or, or the framework upon which the EPC strategy you know, um, should continue to be adopted. 
Some of the reasons why we continue to have this high rate of delays and disruptions would be scope changes, design misalignments, and contract administration inefficiencies. Those are the top three from um, research that is available. And of course, the implications for APC contracting would be claims and disputes. And we all know that with claims and disputes come significant value erosion and um, yet again, just questioning the basis upon which we have chosen an APC strategy in the first place. So the final challenge I'll talk about really is the elephant in the room, and that is the energy transition. And so beyond the um, challenge I, I mentioned first, which is the challenge of declining investment, you do have um, the concern around energy transition and the drive by the de developed world to cut back on the use of fossil fuels in generating energy. So with this push and this drive um, by, by the world, what we see, of course, is greater scrutiny on the types of projects that are undertaken. We also see shrinking financing um, to traditional oil and gas um, investments. And then, of course, the E and P companies, so the operators or the project owners, as well as the EPC contractors are really struggling to stay investable, you know, in these times. But our reality as Africa is that although we're a resource-rich, um, you know, continent, we're faced with a crisis of energy poverty. And so part of the challenge for us with energy transition is actually thinking about how to create that balance between solving our immediate energy crisis and then also supporting this lower carbon future that we're all looking um, um, for or seeking. You know, and so just thinking about energy transition, the implications for EPC contracting would be, you know, like we already see, there's a rapid change in digital technology. And there is a rapid change also in the need for diversification and innovation. And if you really cannot keep up with the pace, then you're not, you know, going to be able to sustain um, EPC contracting. And then there will be the potential for fewer traditional oil and gas projects. But, you know, again, based on the trends, the view is that the position ultimately from an EPC contracting perspective would be that it will be neutral. And it will be neutral because of some of the opportunities that we'll talk about. So here we have a few opportunities, again, to kind of address the challenges that I've highlighted and um, opportunities for addressing declining investment and, and delays and disruptions to our projects. So for declining investment, the parties here that um, do have um, some opportunities really would be our contractors and our governments. And I'll just touch on one key point here for the contractors, and that would be creative EPC solutions. We honestly cannot continue to operate the way we used to operate in the past if we will succeed as a value chain. If we will keep EPC contracting going, we cannot operate the way we used to operate in the past. And so with regard to creative EPC solutions, some um, EPC contractors today are able to offer um, support for prefab work, modularization, and there's the new trend around project production techniques, which really, you know, in simple terms, is just adopting some of the techniques from manufacturing and bringing that to uh, project management. So again, the techniques from manufacturing um, weren't exactly adopted, you, you know, in project execution, but with the gains in manufacturing, this project production management systems um, and techniques has really been um, gradually adopted by projects to drive efficiency. So with regard to delays and disruptions, um, the parties that would have some opportunities would be the project owners and contractors. And um, a key point of owners would be uh, focus on front end work. So IPA would refer to this as front end loading but it's a great focus on the front end activities that would enable greater clarity at the time of detailed design, greater clarity with the items that are procured, so you cut down on the changes that come up as 
work progresses. So the final opportunity I would talk about here would be on energy transition. And of course, we did mention the concerns around shrinking financing and the potential for fewer traditional oil and gas investments and oil and gas projects. But there are opportunities and, um, you know, whether in the, in the short to medium term, there would certainly be the aggressive drive towards eliminating flaring and venting. But the idea is how do we cut back on carbon emissions? And that provides an opportunity for um, EPC contracting. Because of course you would require um, your gas gathering and compression facilities to be able to actually catch and eliminate flaring or venting. And then of course, for Africa, gas is now deemed as the transition fuel. And so it is anticipated that we would have major infrastructure projects to be able to support gas as the transition fuel. And lastly, you know, new energy diversification. There's a way now with metal mining. Of course, there are discussions around hydrogen and other um, energy. There is a wave around metals mining. And again, these are opportunities that easy the value party can um, take advantage of. So the point that I will close with really is that the times are different and the parties we must think about partnership, collaboration, and you know, just unique out-of-the-box solutions if we intend to keep EPC cutting alive and thriving. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was on mute. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, thank you, Uze, for that fascinating insight into the uh, perspective from the energy space. Um, uh, moving on to our Lucifone African specialist on the panel, I'd like to introduce Renata Valenti. Renata is a founding partner of PLMJ Colab Angola, RVA and Avocados. She has extensive experience in supporting companies that want to set up or operate businesses in Angola and has, has been dedicated exclusively to the Angolan market for 15 years. In addition to corporate and M&A matters, she provides advice on employment law, real estate and construction, including real estate investment bodies, regulatory law and compliance, and private investment projects. In recent years, she's worked on technical assistance projects for Angolan public bodies in the water and sanitation sector financed by the African Development Bank. Um, Renata will now speak to us about opportunities and challenges in Lucifer Africa with some specific examples from Angola. Renata. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And thank you to ACL to, to include a bit of Lusophony in this conference because we see a lot of regional events, um, but many times not reference to Portuguese speaking countries and we are still a few, so it's very good to be included in events like this. So, just checking on the slides, sorry. So, but as an introduction, uh, and I'm here since yesterday, so probably most of the things are cross jurisdictional uh, in African countries. But to give you a, a brief overview on our Lusophone countries, especially Angola and Mozambique, because these are the largest uh, countries where we have relevant EPCs. I would start by saying that most of our public infrastructure projects are based on EPCs, of course. And thinking about Angola and Mozambique, we have projects related to new airports, I'm not sure about the other countries, but we do not have these. I'm not about it, but we have several new cities built by Chinese conglomerates or Israeli conglomerates based on cities. Ready when you are. So. 
thinking about this uh, and and of course my my arguments are always more related to Angola than other uh, Portuguese speaking countries but the Biden is based on a sort of other requirements and not in a not in a and yeah, we will also understand uh, the pros and cons of having EPCs in in this case, especially when the design is made by people never visited the country, and it was also uh, spoke yesterday. We don't have a common draft to use, so depending on the product, sometimes the contractor is allowed to give his own draft, but the risk is that the draft is not compliant with local procurement uh, rules. But in many cases, and I've seen this in relevant projects in Angola, the public entity just gives you a draft fully compliant with the pro public procurement rules, then it's not a Okay, for, the, for those of you online, it seems we've lost Twin Waters at the moment, but it looks like uh, that problem is being worked on. So let's just give it a minute. Amin or Mohammed, can you just confirm that you can hear me clearly, even though uh, we were losing the conference room? No, we can hear you. Can, I can hear you very well, Andrew. I can also hear you, Andrew. Great, thanks. Yeah. And can, can you hear me? Um, it's no. still very broken up coming from Twin Waters at the moment. So go. Okay, moving forward. So I was I was speaking about some issues on content, material, staffing, and services. Uh, please, can you go ahead? So. Another discussion I'm having with my friends, engineers and lawyers uh, that work in these regions, and probably this is not only in Angola, Mozambique, or Fair, is the risk of having wild, uh, white elephant projects. And this is why I'm discussing here the adequacy of the projects involved in EPC financed by foreign institutions to the realities, because we are facing some difficulties in adjusting the project to the reality because the the selection is not only based on low bidding costs and no one really thinks on the maintenance and the operational costs so here moving yeah so i already mentioned this point the, here in my second point, many large infrastructure projects are designed by experts with relevant knowledge of the population. I'm thinking about the huge Chinese cities built in Angola at the moment. We have cities for more than 100,000 people. And, and these people was not even used to live in, in 10 floor buildings. So the, the integration of the populations is not very easy. And sometimes the projects are not immediate needs because we wish we before 
we see also a poor involvement of the employer, uh, the government itself in public infrastructure, and normally there's legal transfer and capacity building is to give you an idea, this, and nothing gets changed. The, the, the good example we have locally that they will have a good better interaction between the needs. So there's not a skill transfer, a uh, 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 know how transfer, and there's no training of the local staff. So we have great industries, but then no one can operate it. It's a bit difficult. And my last point here is the need of institutional building. In Angola, we don't have a, a public institution sponsored for all, all infrastructures or for planning infrastructures in the country. Meaning that we have a mini responsible for uh, an PC or, or thousands of APCs in uh, residential infrastructures. Let, let's think about that. Then we have the energy and water ministry thinking about the water and sanitation. Filters. Then we have the education ministry thinking about building a school, but thinking of school. We are missing a number that connects all the dots and make sure that we do have a plan that leads all the infrastructures in the country to, to, to be more adequate to the needs. So, so here about pros and cons. I, I'm sure I'm not giving you any news because this is quite similar in our jurisdictions. But looking to the challenges, and, and coming here, I, I, I spoke also to engineers, not to have only the legal perspective of things, but the, what people from these countries are feeling at the moment is that governments are paying higher prices. They could be paying without APT. And that it's difficult to accommodate subcontracting requirements imposed by employer. And sometimes the employer imposes um, because of local convictions, it imposes a certain subcontractor or that needs to be When, uh, when when thinking about the dispute before getting there, because of course we live in local and, and the, having local as well will also raise issues with bankability, bankability many times. And concerning Angola, we have seen a lot of uh, demands to impose the state of arbitration in Angola. This raises another because internally in Angola, this should be absolutely understand that only Angola lawyers can be arbitrations. This is still being discussed. And there is a trend to say that arbitrators need to be Angolans as well. So this raises another issues with the financing institution, the, the international contractor, and so on. So I think we still have a lot of challenges. Of course, there are advantages, and we, I'm sure we use more and more this model of We need to think about challenges and to how the challenge of the international practices and, and requirements of having an EPC with the local players, because we cannot forget that they exist. And they, in at least from where I come from, they're not very comfortable in having imposed EPCs because they feel just a bit put outside. So, speak to you soon. Um, I'm sure you will, you will have a lot of experience.
Okay, it was, it was hard to hear the end of that. I, I'm assuming that, Renata, you've come to an end. Is that correct? Okay. I think... Um, it, uh, Andrew, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you now. Fantastic. So Renata has just, um, just concluded her presentation. Wonderful. So Thank you. We can hear you clearly. Okay, great. Yeah. Unfortunately, for the um, for the online participants, I think Renata, we, we lost a lot of what you had to say, unfortunately. But um, we'll, we'll push on, and hopefully, we catch up with some of the issues in the Q and A at the end. Um, so I think uh, that brings us to our next speaker. And, um, uh, what will be hopefully helpful for the online participants, online presenters, um, Mr. Mohammed Abdul Nabi. Mohammed is the Vice Branch Manager for Technical Affairs at Arab in Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt. Arab contractors are known for being one of the largest construction firms in Africa and in the Middle East, and have more than 18 working branches in Africa, excluding the head office in Egypt. Mohammed has experience in various infrastructure sectors, including bridges, tunnels, buildings and housing, marine works, shore protection, dams, power, sports stadiums, and roads, within the framework of PPP, sovereign loans, and direct and export credit financing. He's worked on projects in both private and public sectors, of that, Mohammed will present to us on the future of EPC contracts in Egypt, with a particular emphasis on the boom in infrastructure projects. Mohammed. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for this uh, brief and kind intro. Uh, I'm very proud, uh, and it's giving me pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I will uh, have a short uh, presentation about the EPC contracts, especially in Egypt. Uh, you are now uh, uh, here in Egypt. You can see everywhere, everywhere here in Egypt and in, in Cairo, huge billboards advertise new construction projects. Uh, Cairo is not the only uh, area with, with these projects, but all over Egypt, all over Egypt, huge construction are taking place. Uh, I, uh, I think... Uh, I will uh, share uh, my slides. Uh, just make sure it's uh, it's presented. Um, all over Egypt, all over Egypt, there is a huge construction taking place. This construction is almost now for the last four years, at least over then 30 billion of uh, US dollars worth of real estate and construction and infrastructure projects has been awarded. This makes Egypt uh, the first and the only region and the only country in the Middle East and the uh, Africa and the North Africa region that has greaten or risen her uh, spending on project during the past two years. However, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and the Russian and Ukrainian uh, war. Uh, on 2018, there is 33 billion US dollars worth projects have been awarded and contracts have been started. Uh, we are here sure that this uh, construction project and this boom in, in the construction market will remain at least at least for a double or uh, for, for, for decades to come. This is due to that Egypt is the first country in the in Africa in, in, in Africa or on the Arab world with 100 million population with an increase of about 1 million or or, 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 or more than 1 million every year 50 percent of this population is below the age of 25 years this makes uh, the Egyptian uh, country, uh, this requires the Egyptian country and the Egyptian uh, ministry to uh, solve the problem of the need, of the tremendous need of 
housing, uh, infrastructure, and service by introducing new projects and introducing new investments to put this uh, to put a solution for this increase. Uh, this project, Egypt here, are now in have seven, or at least seven, uh, new integrated urban cities in the new capital, the new city of Alamein, Mansoura, Port Said, uh, Qena, uh, Toshka, Nasser City, in Asyut. This diversity of uh, integrated urban cities all over Egypt from the north at the Mediterranean Sea till the, the south and Aswan and in Toshka uh, makes Egypt really a big and a huge construction uh, site. Uh, this uh, project also uh, includes all the infrastructures all the housing, all the uh, the surface, the service required, and all the uh, transportations required to do this uh, city and to uh, mobilize people to this city. It's not only it's not only the uh, the new cities, but also we uh, we we have started here in projects like. Uh, uh, LRT, Metro, Underground, uh, high-speed train from all over all over Egypt is now working and have started. Uh, projects have been completed in the tourism uh, construction of the Grand Egyptian Museum, uh, nuclear power in uh, in El Daba, uh, also new ports. Have been introduced in East Port Said, in Sokhna, in Alexandria, in Damiata. Uh, all these projects and new projects will be introduced uh, during the, the the new decades and the the the, the few uh, post uh, the few uh, few future years are all opportunities that will allow Egypt to have tremendous and uh, booming in the construction market especially in the EPC, uh, uh, in the EPC contract. Uh, this is due to that all these projects have been designed or have been awarded as a design and build with uh, an, an EPC contract. However, this, uh, this tremendous and, and, booming, uh, and booming in construction, there is a lot of challenges have faced uh, the construction market in Cairo or in Egypt. Uh, some of them were, were due to the funding allocations in, in, in Africa and in Egypt due to the pandemic that have uh, arisen uh, after the COVID, during and after the COVID uh, pandemic. And after that was uh, also uh, the uh, Russian and, uh, and Ukrainian war. This uh, have tremendous uh, delay on the allocation of the funding and uh, in, in addition to uh, delay in the, uh, in the funding allocation by the investors, not only from the uh, not only from the lenders, but only the investors are now delaying the process due to the pandemic that have uh, arisen. Uh, delays and disruptions that occur due to this pandemic have also delayed the projects and delayed the, uh, the construction market. Almost about one year now, projects are delayed due to uh, the, the global circumstances. There is uh, also the high inflation rates that affect the, the EPC projects, uh, affect the pricing, affect the, uh, the, the, the contract award uh, due to the high inflation and unpredicted uh, inflation rates due to the global and the uh, current circumstances here in Egypt. Uh, due to the diversity and, and, and as I said before, uh, 
we, we, Egypt is working all over Egypt, there is a, a problem in handing over the site in time due to uh, some uh, local uh, problems with the with the with the with 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 the with the Egyptian uh, population. Uh, also, uh, there is a problem now and a challenge now to be uh, uh, addressed for the labor and material shortage and equipment shortage due to the huge number of projects working now. It's, I think now we are talking about 30 billion or 33 billion per year. So there is a shortage in labor and material and equipment. This in addition to the, uh, the supply chain that already affected all the, uh, the world and global uh, Uh, the world and global construction market. Uh, however, all these challenges, however, all these challenges, uh, there is still for at least for at least two decades in Egypt here, there will be projects, there will be an opportunity for EPC projects with not less than 30 billions per year, 30 billion US dollars per year for the next at least two decades. Uh, if a, a, a good and uh, uh, and the funding allocation was was presented in time. I think we would we would find this uh, available uh, and project will uh, will 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 remain uh, on not on a schedule but on on a good schedule. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, very much. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, Mohammed, for the presentation. Um, okay, so where are we? Um, okay, so the next, um, uh, our next esteemed panelist is Mr. Aliodi Delano. Aliodi is a partner in Aiken Delano Legal Practitioners, a full service law firm with offices in Lagos, Abuja and Ibadan. He heads the firm's corporate and commercial banking and corporate finance practice um, and advises on matters such as privatization, syndicated lending, project and corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, foreign investment advisory services, and construction and real estate. He has extensive practical experience in a range of corporate and project finance transactions, and he leads ALP's team of lawyers in dealing with infrastructure projects, including the Lecky Free Zone Development Project, the rehabilitation of the Nigerian Railway, the construction of the new railway system for Nigeria, and the Lagos Light Rail Project. Um, he's conferred with the rank of Senior Advocate of Nigeria, so we're delighted to have him speaking with us today. Um, Aliodi will now share his insights with respect to this morning's topic from a Nigerian public infrastructure procurement perspective, and to do that I will pose some particular questions to him which he will then answer. Um, so if we can just, um, once he has a microphone in front of him, if you can just confirm you're ready to go, then I will pose you the first of the questions. Um, Twin Waters seems to be on mute from our perspective. Okay. Are we good to go? Can you hear me? Yes, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the IMF estimates that Nigeria's infrastructure will acquire circa 14 billion per year over the next decade. And the Institute of Appraisers and Cost Engineers has said that Nigeria would require about $2.9 trillion investment in the next 30 years to close the current infrastructure gap in the country. In your opinion, does EPC contracting offer a solution to Nigerian public infrastructure deficit? Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. And, uh, in, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think the numbers speak for themselves. You know, when you when you have um, such large two trillion dollars required uh, in uh, in a short space of time, then um, clearly there's significant opportunity. I mean, if we listen to, uh, I think it was Mohammed's 
closing remarks, and he was saying that, you know, in Egypt, for the next um, for the next two decades, they're looking at uh, projects abound. Um, if we look at uh, Nigeria's um, recent history, I would say that uh, this infrastructure deficit is a challenge that that our governments have have tried to um, remedy with um, PPP in the last 20 years, there was a flurry activity there, activity there, um, and it's very clear and, uh, and obvious that uh, the government doesn't have the funding for uh, developing infrastructure, which means that you have to have these PPP models and PPP models require EPC contracting. So I would say that um, the opportunities for EPP, EPC contracting are, are um, uh, quite robust. Um, if we look at some of what we've seen also in the privatization sector, we've seen privatization of uh, particularly not the electricity industry, which has uh, also yielded a lot of, uh, a lot of EPC contracting. Um, whether or not uh, this has been a success, it's a slightly different issue. But I also need to consider a slightly different point. Oh, uh, so it, we also consider a different is um, whether EPC contracting actually solves some of the problems that of, of failed infrastructure. So we've had years and years in Africa, in Nigeria, let me say, of white FM projects that have been designed by somebody, built by somebody, traditional models that just have worked. And it occurred to me that maybe this, um, this model of contracting, which um, is, if I can call it that, single obligor. So, the, the uh, contractor is responsible for design, contractor is responsible for construction. Will that solve some of Africa's problems, some of Nigeria's problems? Why are we failing in delivering this infrastructure? And is this contracting model actually uh, a solution in itself and therefore an opportunity in itself to actual delivery of uh, infrastructure projects. So when you look at it, uh, and I, I mean, I'm a lawyer, but I looked at some of the, the research on why have these projects failed? You know, you have poor planning, corruption, uh, budget delays, you know, uh, stakeholder engagement not being there. And you, and you would sort of imagine that if you have an EPC contract where the risk is completely transferred or, or almost completely transferred to the contractor, you're unlikely or you should not get uh, these failed projects, particularly if, it's, if the EPC contract is, in a, is on, a, um, on a PPP model. So everything ideally ought to be aligned to create a solution that the project is going to be delivered, the sanctity of uh, uh, timelines, you know, the funding is usually uh, preset, the project has to be bankable. So from that, I, I looked at it from that context a little bit and I thought that yes, this in it, uh, EPC contract in, its, in itself might provide a solution for Africa and for our approach to all the, the, the myriad of problems that we have. Of course, it creates its own challenges as well. Uh, um, maybe I can mention a few. Uh, Renata mentioned it a little bit. Um, you have a situation where mega projects have to be uh, funded and it requires you have, 
you don't get a lot of local participation and you don't get the development of your own uh, construction industry. There's no transfer of technology. Uh, uh, all this results in uh, it's a catch-22. So you don't you don't get the gains that uh, the construction is supposed to yield in, uh, in uh, for the local for the local economy, uh, and that's sort of the, the the challenge that I can see. Um, obviously. Uh, 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 another point that is worth making is that whether the EPC contract delivers on some of these benefits that I was talking about resolving the white elephant um, projects depends on the on the process for that yields the contract in the first place. If you have a situation where uh, political interference and corruption has infiltrated the system uh, to in the appointment of the EPC contractor in the first place uh, and in the determination of the project, then, I mean, we're, we're back to square one. Even the, the, the model of the contract doesn't solve any problem. It only does if the process is, is robust. You know, so uh, those are my views on, on that. Yep, understood. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, another question for you then. Um, when you examine Nigeria's investment environment, and more specifically when you benchmark the standard standards of its regulations against other countries globally, the country still seems to be falling behind. With the Index of Economic Freedom ranking at 120, 120 globally in business freedom, the rule of law and regulatory efficiency. In this context, do you feel the legal regime is conducive for EPC contracting in Nigeria? Um, that's a difficult question, Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, Nigeria's uh, legal regime is, if I mean, as a lawyer, I have to say it's, it's weak. I think it's weak for, for what EPC contracting requires. Again, if we start from the, um, from the source, and if we view EPC contracting as a subset of the PPP model, then you have to have a, a pretty robust PPP framework, a PPP um, for you to be able to say, yeah, the, our legal regime is um, suitable. And even though, as I said, um, we had a very uh, bad and PPP was a, a buzzword over the last 20 years or so, it, it hasn't really yielded um, much in terms of delivery of public infrastructure. Um, a lot of EPC gas industry, but uh, not so much in, in the provision of regular public infrastructure. And we need infrastructure housing in transport, in waste disposal, water infrastructure, a lot of things. So that framework, I would say, is, is weak. Um, you have a federal law, uh, you have the Infrastructure um, Concession Regulatory Commission, which the law creating it doesn't really seem beyond establishing the commission and saying, and sort of authorizing uh, government entities to enter into private, um, into PPP arrangements. So um, the PPP framework is weak. Um, the other aspect that's worth mentioning, and again, Renate uh, mentioned this a little bit, is um, that we also have uh, local content legislation. That's the police sword. From the point of view of the EP, EPC contractor, uh, local content is, is a bit of a disaster. 
uh, particularly as Renato mentioned, you're trying to import, and as is often the case with uh, contractors, you, I mean, you, if your financing is coming from China, all your equipment is coming from China, there's a lot of, um, of um, personnel coming from China. So there might be distance from, from, from that perspective and it creates a difficulty in um, the EPC model as a, as a solution. Um, but the, and at the same time, there's a, the, the local perspective. If you have the insistence on having a local input, which is desirable, but the skills are not available, uh, the materials are not available, and then you have, a, a, again, a, a catch-22 situation where you can't solve the problems. You're not, you're, I mean, you're getting the problems uh, on a double-edged basis. Um, the last point I'll just uh, say on this is um, our judicial system. Uh, I mean, I'm sure many people here are lawyers, and many people here will, will have felt I certainly feel the, um, the perception of the public that uh, um, judicial system is weak. Um, and uh, with uh, claims that can arise. Um, and, you know, again, taking from what Renata said, uh, I don't see us um, being able to uh, resist uh, international arbitration and, and trying to insist, for example, on domestic, domestic arbitration for resolution of disputes. Because I think we ourselves will probably acknowledge that, you know, I have to say that when they have the weakness of the of the judicial system. So people are finding it's easier to um, to operate and maybe in the, in the foreseeable move, you know, maybe in the future we will in that direction, but at the moment we're not quite there. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for that. Those were really uh, helpful insights. Um, so moving on to our last panelist to introduce today, it's um, Amin Musa joining us from Kenya. Amin is a partner and the head of the Project and Infrastructure Department at ALN Kenya, Anjawala and Kana, and is generally considered the leading energy and projects lawyer in the country. He specializes in energy, projects, infrastructure, natural and, and renewable resources, as well as real estate and privatization. Under Amin's leadership, in Kenya, and significant power infrastructure large capital development and natural resources projects in the region. Eamon has acted for sponsors on a number of groundbreaking clean energy projects that have achieved commercial operations, including the 300 megawatt Lake Takana and 100 megawatt uh, Capetto energy wind projects and the 400 megawatt Malindi solar project. Amin has also acted for a number of sponsors in acquiring equity interests in a number of energy and infrastructure projects including the acquisition of several power generation and development assets in Madagascar. So with that, um, Emma will now t speak to us about the topical issues of dealing with COVID force mature issues and the impact of risk allocation, cost time provisions, due to disruptions. And for that, I'll kick you off with a couple of questions. Um, I mean, what has been your experience during the COVID dealing with force mature issues and claims on projects and at such time, specifically relating to government and corresponding structures. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that uh, introduction. B before I start uh, to answer that question, I, I think uh, part of the reason we're having the disturbance on the sound is that 
uh, we're not on mute. I think uh, I think we're now on mute, which is great. On on the physical location, uh, but uh, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, obviously, just before COVID, there were a whole host of you know construction projects ongoing in East Africa, and we were involved on a number of them. Uh, in relation to the sponsors that were developing these projects. More specifically, we had four power projects being developed uh, in Kenya, a 100 megawatt wind project being developed by Actis, uh, and three 40 megawatt solar projects being developed by Globalec and Frontier. And as you can imagine, uh, uh, as the COVID crisis descended uh, upon us, uh, everyone, all relevant stakeholders faced significant challenges in, in dealing with uh, COVID-19 and force majeure and their direct impact on live construction projects, uh, some of them very large, uh, project financed in the traditional way uh, with DFIs and large commercial banks. And uh, you could imagine force majeure claims, frankly, were flying all over the place. Uh, and I guess just to touch on the types of uh, force majeure issues and claims, uh, we were seeing, I thought it would be a useful exercise in getting to understand how, when, you know, the black swan events actually do occur, uh, how are your provisions in your construction contracts, how are your considered risk allocation structures in your constru construction contracts, how do they really play out when you do have these black swan events and frankly that's when you get the true test of you know what your clauses said how you structured risk allocation uh and who was required to bear that risk uh under these events uh i would i would assume before covid uh most people look at their uh provisions on force majeure as a standard clause without paying too much attention to it I can assure you that has changed quite dramatically, and I, I'll deal with that as, as, as a second part uh, on what that is. But in terms of that experience during the worst times of COVID for projects under construction, uh, firstly, uh, obviously you had the developers claiming force majeure under their respective concession or power purchase agreements with the relevant state corporations because clearly their ability to meet the deadlines and the timelines under the concession agreements uh, and the offtake agreements like power purchase agreements were being impacted. And therefore, uh, that was you know uh, one of the very first claims that we had to deal with from a developer perspective. Uh, we then had developers considering that beyond the concession agreement, uh, beyond the offtake agreement, did they need to consider making political force majeure claims under their implementation agreements? Uh, had the, 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 the COVID force majeure event uh, further morphed into a political force majeure event, uh, given the fact that you had lockdowns uh, imposed by governments, you had changes in health and safety regulations, uh, you had restrictions on construction activities, and therefore, uh, you know, you needed to consider whether in addition to looking at the natural force majeure issues, did you need to go a step further under, for example, your implementation agreements 
to consider claims for political force majeure. Uh, and I guess the interesting thing is, is, is that balance between protecting your legal rights and in some ways almost feeling sorry, frankly, for government, uh, because this was clearly beyond their control. So how do you balance, you know, the protection of your legal rights, the protection of your commercial interests, and managing relationships with partners like government and state corporation on a very, very difficult issue clearly beyond control. And that balancing act was, was frankly very interesting to see. And I think those that managed that balancing act appropriately were probably better able to mitigate their risks, uh, were probably better able to get government support and assistance in dealing with these issues. Uh, uh, so I think we, we understood this issue of how do you balance matters, protecting legal rights on one hand, protecting your commercial interests on the other hand, but not forgetting that you have counterparties who are effectively long-term partners like the government, uh, whose relationship needs to be carefully managed uh, on a situation where, unlike in some events uh, where we have issues of political force majeure that are clearly uh, arisen through government action, uh, one could argue that this was clearly one of those black swan events that frankly, it would be very difficult to even blame your governments for that. Uh, you obviously had contractors claiming force majeure under their construction contracts, and the nature of those claims, depending on how they were impacted, uh, was extremely interesting. And then, interestingly, on certain projects where on the completion of these projects, uh, governments would be required to make payments, for example, on a power purchase agreement on a take or pay basis. Uh, we saw some interesting claims coming from governments saying, uh, hang on a minute, we, we, we accept we asked for this infrastructure. And now suddenly the demand for power has collapsed, which in many East African regions and especially Kenya, there was a marked collapse in the demand for power. Uh, and you have four projects coming online to add on power. Uh, and because of these supply demand issues, and obviously you have worsening balance sheets of governments and state corporations as revenues are plummeting, governments are taking emergency loans uh, to deal with COVID. Uh, and so in some cases you even had the government coming out and making force majeure claims and said, uh, we need to wait a little before these projects come online, which clearly creates a rather interesting dilemma for the developers, the financiers, and more interestingly, the contractors who are clearly uh, uh, trying to figure out how they're managing their various conflicts, because do you rely on the government uh, claims to now in turn claim on the construction contracts. So you had a variety of separate, but in many cases related claims flying around these contracts. Now, what were the types of legal issues we were seeing around these various claims? Firstly, as I touched upon, uh, the issue of between natural force majeure versus political force majeure. Uh, and where did COVID-19 sit between these two? And in many of our contracts, the impact, the remedy, and the compensation uh, can change quite significantly depending on whether you are merely a natural force majeure versus being ca categorized uh, as a political force majeure. So for instances where you had government lockdowns, as I said earlier, 
changes in regulations and laws, uh, restrictions on construction activity. Uh, what is the impact of that transition from going from natural force majeure to a political force majeure? Uh, wonderfully complex issues around causation, direct causation, indirect causation in relation to COVID, and how do you actually show, whilst it may seem obvious that COVID caused certain things, actually once you started digging down into the details, the issues of causation uh, became a very interesting talking point between the developers and the contractors uh, in relation to this point. Obviously, the types of remedies available, are you entitled to an extension of time? Are you entitled to costs? Is it direct costs? Is it indirect costs? Does it include profit? And again, how you categorize uh, the force majeure events uh, and where they fit into the overall scheme of remedies and provisions suddenly became incredibly important to be able to figure out as to whether a contractor was merely entitled to an extension of time or whether the contractor was entitled to costs and if so, what type of costs. Uh, the other issue, uh, in a way similar to the causation point, was the whole legal and technical and commercial conversation around mitigation. Uh, what measures were you as a developer vis-a-vis -vis the government taking to mitigate uh, your force majeure issues in relation to COVID? Likewise, Developers were asking contractors, what measures of mitigation have you taken uh, to deal with the impact on our delays uh, and our cost? And, and the issue of the sufficiency or not of these mitigation measures became very interesting legal points for consideration because ultimately they directly were linked to the issue of remedies of time and money. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, we, we, we dealt with this variety of legal issues linked to a variety of interrelated claims. Uh, it, questions and debates about whether those who were impacted by COVID force majeure and that impact was solely in relation to their ability to pay uh, and your ability to raise COVID force majeure because you were simply affected in relation to your one single obligation, which was to make payment. And what was your ability to make that claim? And if you are on the other side, what was your ability to defend uh, that claim? Uh, and so I guess that hopefully gives you uh, some sort of flavor of the, whilst very scary uh, from a health and a social perspective, a uh, period of time, uh, uh, intellectually, from a legal and a commercial perspective, uh, I must admit a rather stimulating period to deal with a variety of these very complex claims and legal issues uh, that arose as a result of COVID. I, I, I completely agree. With you. Um, uh, I guess from my experience now, in terms of what's happening in current negotiations, um, these issues seem to be the last ones left on the table. Perhaps before people didn't focus on as much. Now they're absolutely key focus and they tend to be difficult to get them over the line in the end because everyone assumes the black swans that you talk about might actually happen. Um, so in your view, what's the impact of COVID in the current supply chain issues on negotiating more recent construction contracts and how um, are employers and contractors assessing the risk allocation and contractual provisions? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Andrew. And, and, and like you said, in, 
in addition to dealing with live contracts, the second big, big issue came about in relation to contracts that were under negotiation that hadn't been signed, uh, but were in that negotiation phase during COVID. I think the good thing is both employer and contractor had plenty of time to think about these issues. And in some cases, I think we probably spent uh, most of the COVID period, over a year, simply negotiating risk allocation arrangements and provisions around COVID and black swan events, which in, in some degrees also helped uh, the second black swan event, which we had not considered, which is the, the supply chain issues and then the Ukraine-Russia war issues. So to a certain degree, this 12 months of conversations that we have found ourselves having with contractors on dealing with this uh, certainly helped. In terms of what we saw in a little more detail, around the, the discussion. The, the first principal question uh, that was put forward, especially to contractors by employers and developers who we generally represent is, do you now consider COVID uh, to be an unforeseeable event that is beyond the control of parties? That's the fundamental principle question that has to be asked. And obviously, from an employer perspective, uh, the answer was no. Uh, having said that, they are, we fully appreciate that there are very real and live risks in relation to COVID that are arguably still unforeseeable and unenforceable. And so what we found very helpful as a commercial, technical, and legal exercise, although I must admit very time consuming, is to split the elements of the impact of such events between what we view as foreseeable and what is unforeseeable. Uh, it, it sounds pretty straightforward on its face, but like I said, it took 12 months in many cases to really get an understanding of, of that. And therefore, once you start splitting uh, specific circumstances and events in relation to COVID between two buckets, uh, you then start getting into much more detail around which of these buckets are entitled to time and or cost. How do you deal with onshore events versus offshore events? And where do they fit within these buckets? Uh, how do you deal with the mere occurrence of incidences of COVID-19 say on a particular site versus complete lockdowns and is that distinction required which in our view in many cases making those distinctions and splitting these events between the buckets was hugely useful so that people fully understood that certain types of arguably foreseeable COVID risk should potentially sit with the contractor and maybe the more unforeseeable COVID risks should continue to remain with the employer but with a further layering of time and costs issues onshore and offshore issues uh, that that required i think the other thing we saw as part of this process was a lot more detail uh, in relation to what I would call prevention mitigation plans. Uh, people, uh, uh, both employers and contractors, spent a lot of time uh, 
thinking about their plan Bs and their plan Cs. And in many cases, these were set out in the contractual provisions about if this happens, this is our agreed plan B. And maybe the plan B will not have an impact on time and cost. But the plan C in some respects might have if we have to go through that. Uh, and I guess this links to the bigger issue of supply chain issues, uh, uh, the war in uh, Russia, Ukraine, the sanctions issues, because in a way these are, they have similar considerations and risk allocation issues. Uh, and so how do you deal with this, especially as has been suggested by previous speakers, we all know that for most African project finance deals, uh, to meet the bankability test, you need to have turnkey, fully wrapped, fixed in price, fixed in time, EPC contracts. Otherwise, eight to nine out of 10, you are not meeting the lender's bankability requirements. Uh, how do you manage that given the very real concerns uh, that contractors have about being able to meet these requirements of a fully wrapped, fixed in time, fixed in price contract? And so there are a number of practical issues we have seen uh, being considered and reconsidered. Typical structures pre-COVID was you issued a, a, a full notice to proceed, an FNTP. You then conducted detailed design, and then you set out your entire procurement method, methodology. But at the time you were doing that, the prices were fixed. The timings were fixed. And this was a fairly straightforward arrangement between contractors and employers. You can imagine, uh, contractors being a lot more nervous about these traditional structures, given all that is going on. And so how do you manage it? We have now seen contracts being split between design phase and agreeing on a clear procurement strategy, at which point you then fix price, fix uh, the timing, and fix the EPC wrap. Uh, to be able to manage these risks. And obviously, in many cases, can, coming to an initial cost to the developer, uh, who in many cases used equity uh, to, to, to fund this process. Uh, we have seen instances, for example, of supply arrangements being removed from the overall EPC wrap. Uh, one classic example was our client, prior to even completing his main construction contract and prior to achieving financial close, entered into supply contracts for steel and other critical equipment using equity, uh, funded those, uh, and frankly did very well on pricing, uh, if uh, I, I may add. And then you're now trying to figure out how do you incorporate these pre-financial close contracts and arrangements uh, that have been equity funded? How do you now incorporate them, firstly, from a construction perspective with your now overall construction contracts? And how do you incorporate them into your financing arrangements in terms of how, for example, your drawdowns are, what your debt and equity contributions are? So I, I think we have seen uh, a number of out-of-the-box initiatives by developers and contractors to still make arrangements work. People still want to do deals, even in these troubling times. And it, it, is, uh, it is in these times, frankly, where you see the greatest amount of innovation, 
structures and thoughts uh, and ideas around how you overcome the problem rather than saying, well, we're going to stop building in Africa because it's just too difficult. Uh, and I think in that respect, it has been a, from an intellectual perspective, a, a wonderfully cha challenging times for all relevant parties, employers, contractors, engineers, lawyers, everybody. Uh, and, I, and I hope this innovation will allow us to think beyond uh, the black swan events for what structures Africa needs to develop larger uh, and more in volume of infrastructure and, and how we reconsider our financing and construction structures going forward. I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Um, uh, unfortunately, we'd we'd hope to have a bit more uh, opportunity for the panel then to speak together at the end of this um, this presentation. But uh, uh, being told that we're out of our time now, so thank you to all the the panelists for um, for their contribution today. And um, I'd like to again thank the ACL for our opportunity to to speak. Um, and apologize for, for those of you in the audience that had some questions for the panel because we are unfortunately now out of time. So with that, um, we will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Amin. Thanks, everyone. Please put your hands together again for the panel. Interesting um, discussion. So we'll be moving on to the next panel.